Hi folks, don't adjust your screen. Your brightness is just fine. It's dark in here for a reason. Uh, I'm Mr. Panola and today we're gonna take a look at light, which we had introduced a little bit last time. Light that comes like from this flashlight. Now, in the last video that you saw, we talked about the speed of light and light was an electromagnetic wave. So it traveled at three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. But what is light made up of? Is light a whole bunch of little particles that move in a stream through the air or through any medium? Or is light, like we talked about, a wave that is constantly moving up and down at the same time that the energy travels across? Well, this was a question that baffled scientists for many, many years. They really couldn't figure out was light a whole bunch of little particles moving through the air or was it truly a wave? And so this question stumped the scientific community. They wanted to find out, was light truly a bunch of particles that were moving through the air or was light a wave like we've been discussing over the past couple of classes? Today, we're going to take a look at evidence, and we're going to see if that evidence supports the idea that light is made of a particles, or if it supports the idea that light is a wave. That's a little better. Now it's a little brighter in here, and we can start taking a look at evidence and see, does light behave like a stream of particles, or does it behave like a wave? First, we're going to take a look at evidence that light is actually composed of a bunch of little particles that are traveling through space. And so if this is true, it would look something like this. You would have your beam of light, and you would have lots of tiny little particles within that beam of light traveling across, and the light would move from one place to another. And so many scientists at the time believe this. They thought that light was indeed a stream of a bunch of tiny little particles. In fact, one of the most famous scientists in his time believed this, and that was Sir Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton was perhaps the most famous scientist at the time who firmly believed that light was a stream of particles. And he believed this for two reasons. Newton's first reason for saying that light was a stream of particles was that light travels in a straight line. He felt that if light moved in a straight line directly from one place to another, that it had to be a bunch of little particles that were also moving in that same straight line. But it can be a little bit hard to see light actually moving in a straight line. So let's take a look at light as it moves, as Newton said, in a straight line. Well, I guess the lights being on didn't last all that long. Instead, to prove that light moves in a straight line, we have a laser beam which I have here mounted on a stand. You can just barely make it out on the side of your screen. But if I touch the button on the laser beam, you will notice that it sends a laser at this piece of paper. Well, I'm gonna fix my laser beam so that it stays inside this clamp. Now the laser beam is permanently on without me having to press the button. I'm also going to take this substance. This is called fog in a can. And so it's going to make a little bit of a cloud behind my desk. I'm going to shake it up and spray it. Do you see the beam of light? You can actually see the line once we reveal it using the fog in the can. Here it is again. This is really clear evidence that light definitely travels in a straight line. And according to Isaac Newton, 
That was one of the reasons that light must be considered a particle. So Isaac Newton believed that light traveled in a straight line and that therefore made it a stream of particles. But he had a second reason to make this claim. Newton also claimed that light was a stream of particles because light casts a shadow. This means that when light is shining on an object, the light is not allowed to pass through. And that's why the area behind a solid object looks dark and it would be encased in shadows. Let me show you a little bit about what that looks like. I'm gonna turn off the lights again. Well, our lights have been turned off, but I'm here with a textbook to show you how light casts a shadow. If I have a source of light and I hold it behind the textbook, you will notice that there's an area behind the screen that is not lit up. And that means that light must be made up of particles that aren't allowed to pass through the textbook. So the fact that light casts a shadow, Newton said that that's more evidence that light must be a stream of particles. Now, Newton was so confident that light was a stream of particles that he even gave these little particles a name. He said that the little particles that make up light are called photons, P-H-O-T-O-N-S. Notice the word photo, like photograph, is in that word. Well, you need lights to take photographs, and it makes sense that little particles of light would be called photons. And photons, he gave the definition to, he said that photons are like little packets of energy. That make up light. So these photons were where the energy came from. We already know that waves transfer energy. So light must be carrying energy in the form of these little photons. And so Newton firmly believed that these little photons were the particles that made up light. And he was led to believe that because of the fact that light travels in a straight line and because of the fact that light casts a shadow. Now, Sir Isaac Newton was not the only scientist who was convinced that light was a stream of particles. In fact, there's another really famous scientist that you've probably heard of, and his name is Albert Einstein. Einstein also believed that light was a stream of particles, and he had an experiment to prove it. Einstein did what was called the photo electric effect. Notice there's that word again, photo. Anytime you see that word or that prefix photo, that likely means that we're going to have something to do with light. And so that's exactly what Einstein did. Einstein took a metal plate. Okay, it was curved a little bit. And he gave that plate a negative charge. Then he took another plate we can imagine this as a, as a vertical plate. And he gave this plate a positive charge. Now, there were a whole bunch of electrons in the negative plate that wanted to move to the, to the positive plate. Maybe you remember from last year that electrons are negatively charged, and they are little tiny particles that are attracted to positive charges because opposites attract. We'll talk more about that later in the year. But these tiny little electrons wanted desperately to move over to where the positive electrons were. But they couldn't. And that's because they lacked enough energy. So Einstein decided he was going to try to give them energy. And he did that by using a light. And so Einstein took a light and he shined it on the first plate.
and Einstein believed that the photons would strike the plate. And when the photons struck the plate, their energy would knock out the electrons and send them flying across. And that's exactly what Einstein discovered. He noticed that when the photon struck the plate, that they knocked these electrons off and they were able to travel. Now, this didn't work with all colors of light, but the fact that it did work with some colors was enough proof to Einstein that light must behave like a stream of particles and must contain photons. Now, I know what you're thinking. Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein agreeing on something? That's like a dream team. However, scientists still weren't convinced that light was made up of particles. In fact, many scientists, including way back in the day, Thomas Young, believed that light behaved like a wave. So this fellow named Thomas Young set out to do some experiments to prove that light behaved like a transverse wave, like we've always discussed with electromagnetic waves. And so Jung did an interesting experiment. He took a source of light much like Einstein did. And he shined that light at an object that had two empty slits cut in it. And those slits looked something like this. And so the rest of the object was open. I'm sorry, the rest of the object was closed off. But the two slits, light would be able to pass through. And so Jung sent his light through the two slits, and he shined it on another piece of paper. And he expected that if light was composed of a bunch of different particles, that he would just simply see two lines on the other side. So for example, if he decided to use red light, Young believed that he would see two long strips of red appear on the other side. But when he did the experiment, that's not what he found. In fact, he found a bunch of long strips of red on the other side. Now those strips of red got less and less intense the further they went from the middle. But he still was really surprised to see that there were so many strips of red as opposed to just two. And so Thomas Young said that what must have happened was interference, which we've learned about in the past. That's when a wave can overlap with another wave or with itself. And he said the areas where he noticed these strips of red were areas of constructive interference, which I'll abbreviate CI. And he said that the areas where there were gaps between the strips were, you guessed it, areas of destructive interference. And so Thomas Young made the claim that if light can interfere with itself and cause these strong colored bands of constructive interference, and also these gaps of destructive interference, that light can't behave like individual little particles. He said that light must be a wave because it can interfere with itself. But that wasn't the only piece of evidence that Thomas Young used. So Thomas Young's double slit experiment, as he came to call it, was one bit of evidence that light must behave like a wave. However, he also had a second piece of evidence. 
Remember how Isaac Newton said that when light casts a shadow, that that was evidence that it was a stream of particles? Well, Thomas Young noticed that there were blurry edges. around shadows. In other words, if there was a book that light was shining on, the edges were a little bit blurry. It still cast a shadow, but it wasn't perfectly crisp lines. And so Thomas Young said that that meant that light was not particles, that it was a wave that was moving around this barrier. And that's why the edges were a little bit blurry. And Jung said, hey, the blurriness on the edges, that's caused by diffraction. And you might remember diffraction from our last wave unit. That's when a wave bends to move around a barrier. And so Thomas Young said that this is what was happening with light, that it was bending to move around the edges of the object that was creating the shadow. So Thomas Young used Newton's bit of evidence of shadows almost against him to now give evidence that light could potentially be a wave. So this is all very confusing. Some scientists at the time said that light is made up of a stream of little particles called photons, but other scientists said that light behaves like a transverse wave, like any other electromagnetic wave. So what's the answer? Is light a stream of particles or is it a wave? Well, to be honest with you, scientists are still doing research on this. And there have been more and more modern day developments as to this question. But for right now, we can what we can conclude is this, is that light sometimes behaves like a stream of particles and sometimes it behaves like a wave. I know that seems like it's the easy way out, but right now, our best answer is that light behaves like both a stream of particles and a wave, based on the evidence that these scientists have presented. Thanks for watching, folks, and I hope you learned something new about light today.